On February 5th, 2010, York Crown Court became the stage for a high-stakes drama as Harold Landry's trial commenced under intense public scrutiny. The charge was grave, the alleged murder of his wife, Lucy Davis. A year later, the final act of this tragic tale unfolded in early February 2011 at Wolverhampton Court. The air in the courtroom crackled with anticipation as Judge David Fett, renowned for his unyielding demeanor, took his place at the helm. At the heart of this legal maelstrom was Harold Landry, a 64-year-old man caught in the eye of a storm that would determine his fate and unravel a story of sorrow and justice. The prosecutor, Rachel Brand, presented the evidence against Harold, painting a chilling picture of the events leading up to Lucy's tragic death. Brand's cold and precise delivery of facts left little room for doubt about Harold's guilt. Harold Landry had been convicted of murdering his 38-year-old wife, Lucy Davis. Harold, who was supposed to be Lucy's protector, now stood condemned as her murderer. Pete, Harold's friend and lawyer, unable to bear the burden of defending him, passed the case to Andy Childs, an experienced attorney. Childs faced a daunting task, to convince the court that Harold had not intended to kill Lucy, but was driven to uncontrollable aggression. Throughout the trial, Harold was a figure of misery and regret. He wept openly, professing his love for Lucy and expressing deep remorse. He pleaded guilty to manslaughter, hoping to mitigate his sentence. The defense argued that Harold's actions were a result of an irresistible outburst of aggression provoked by circumstances beyond his control. However, this argument faced fierce opposition. The prosecution presented the court with shocking photographs of Lucy's injuries. The sheer brutality depicted in these images spoke volumes, overshadowing Harold's claims of unintentional harm. Each piece of evidence painted a grimmer picture of Harold's actions on that fateful day. When the final verdict was announced, Harold Landry was sentenced to life in prison. The decision brought a sense of closure to the legal process, but left an indelible mark on all those involved. This tragic case stands as a somber reminder of the fine line between love and violence. It underscores the unpredictable nature of human relationships and the devastating consequences when that line is crossed. Lucy Davis's death serves as a poignant example of how quickly love can turn into a nightmare, leaving a trail of heartache and loss in its wake. Domestic violence can lead to fatal consequences, as it did in 1971. Among the picturesque Welsh landscapes, born in the small town of Pontypridd, Lucy Davis was a charming girl whose childhood was filled with unconditional love and warmth. Roger and Andrea, Lucy's parents, created an atmosphere of happiness and comfort in their home. Together with her younger sister, Anna, Lucy grew up in the beautiful village of Gleno. Lucy took her first steps among majestic mountains and enchanting forests. Her charming smile and kind heart set her apart from other children. She easily won the sympathy of her teachers and peers. Seeing his daughter's passion, her father gave her and her sister the opportunity to immerse themselves in the magical world of horseback riding. Under the strict guidance of experienced instructors, they learned the basics of this noble art, conquering peaks and overcoming obstacles. Lucy and Anna became professional horse riders. Spending her childhood in Wales was a real paradise for Lucy Davis. She blossomed like a beautiful flower there, absorbing the beauty of nature and the love of her family and loved ones. The hobby of horse riding not only gave Lucy and Anna loyal companions, but also served as a real school of life. Horses taught them discipline, self-control, and responsibility. The sisters' talent and perseverance were recognized at prestigious competitions, where they won multiple awards. However, Lucy's world wasn't limited to the riding arena. Her excellent mind and hunger for knowledge motivated her to make new discoveries. Music became another passion of young Lucy. She enthusiastically took flute and piano lessons, honing her skills. Her efforts were not in vain. A year later, she played both instruments perfectly, charming audiences with her talent. Lucy was delighted to join the Glamorgan Youth Orchestra, where her musical journey continued to flourish. 
Lucy Davis dedicated herself to refining her musical talents, finding an outlet for her love of music and creativity within the school choir. Music wasn't just a pastime for her. It was a profound means of expression. Growing up, Lucy's days were a blend of carefree play and diligent work, instilling in her a strong foundation of dedication and hunger for knowledge, qualities that would shape her future achievements and endear her to those around her. In high school, Lucy crossed paths with Garrett Jenkinson, a fellow Welshman shrouded in mystery. Despite the enigma surrounding Garrett's past, the two formed a close friendship that only deepened over time. Though Garrett harbored romantic feelings for Lucy, he chose to keep them buried deep within himself. Upon graduating in 1998, Lucy was resolute in her pursuit of a musical career and higher education. She secured admission to the University of Yorkshire in Northern England, initially envisioning herself as a future music educator. However, as her ambitions evolved, Lucy found herself drawn to the bustling artistic landscape of a metropolitan city. This newfound aspiration led her to grimy Malister, whose worldview and sense of humor resonated deeply with Lucy. Their relationship flourished, prompting Lucy to introduce Grimy to her parents. The initial encounter proved successful, solidifying the bond between Lucy and Grimy and setting the stage for their future together. Roger and Andrea recognized him as the ideal life partner for their daughter almost instantly. After careful consideration, Lucy and Grimy made the decision to move in together, forging their own family. Sometime after the move, Lucy proposed the idea of official cohabitation, which Grimy agreed to. In 1995, even while still pursuing their studies in college, they welcomed a son into their lives, whom they named James. Lucy opted to take a break from her own pursuits to focus on caring for her son, while Grimy diligently continued his studies to provide for their family, taking up night shifts at the city's postal sorting department. Lucy entered a whirlwind of challenges, but she faced them with optimism and determination. Despite her deep love for her family, the months spent at home with her child were tinged with loneliness. Rarely did she and her husband find time to be together, and his night shifts only exacerbated the situation. Seeking solace and connection, Lucy created a social media account under the pseudonym Miseria immersing herself in a virtual community where she could share her experiences and forge new friendships. It was within this online realm that her attention was captured by a user named Harold Landry, a 53-year-old entrepreneur hailing from Louisiana. Rising from humble beginnings, Harold's fervent pursuit of independence and success from a young age propelled him to establish a thriving company manufacturing hydraulic equipment for major oil companies in the southern United States. His hard work not only brought him material wealth, but also garnered him prestige and eventually billionaire status. Conversing with Harold proved to be a revelation for Lucy. His life experiences, unwavering dedication, and boundless generosity left her captivated. However, their relationship faced its share of challenges. The disparity in their ages, Social standings and lifestyles created friction between them. Harold's life seemed extravagant and diverse, filled with eccentric hobbies and lavish acquisitions, including real estate holdings on KML in Mexico. Harold's marital status was shrouded in mystery. He had been married twice and divorced twice, yet nothing was known about any children from these unions. However, in 1992, Harold's life took a dramatic turn when he divorced his second wife, and crossed paths with Geraldine Price. Geraldine, born in 1966 and originally from Mexico, was 20 years his junior and married to Chris Price with two children. Despite her familial ties, Harold managed to capture the heart of this young woman. On February 6, 1994, Harold orchestrated a romantic dinner for Geraldine in New Orleans. They hired a babysitter, Christian Hurton, to tend to their children, allowing them to enjoy an evening devoid of parental responsibilities. As the night drew to a close, Harold escorted his girlfriend home. In a gesture of gratitude, he offered Christian a ride home, which she accepted. Unbeknownst to Harold, fate had a surprise in store. Chris Price, Geraldine's husband, had been surveilling the couple. 
Upon witnessing their clandestine affair, Chris resolved not to let the matter slide. He pursued Harold, and when they halted at a red light, Chris unleashed a torrent of accusations. Despite Harold's composed demeanor, the situation escalated. In a fit of rage, Chris dared Harold to shoot him. Without hesitation, Harold brandished his firearm, warning Chris of the consequences. Ignoring the warning, Chris goaded Harold further. In a swift and decisive action, Harold fired, striking Chris in the neck. Miraculously, prompt medical intervention spared Chris's life. In 1997, Harold stood trial in St. Mary Parish Courts, charged with the attempted murder of Chris Price. His attorney, Pete Fannin, argued that Harold had been entrapped. Although the jury found Harold guilty of aggravated assault with a weapon, he was sentenced to five years in prison. However, following an appeal, Harold was released on parole after paying a fine and completing community service. Harold found himself forever indebted to Pete for his legal representation and unwavering advocacy, which ultimately secured his freedom. As their friendship blossomed, Harold and Chris reached a settlement agreement, though the exact compensation remained undisclosed. Settling in Covington as a wealthy man, Harold openly shared his past with Lucy, including failed marriages and a troubling incident. Rather than repelling Lucy, Harold's revelations only seemed to deepen her attraction towards him. His gift of persuasion captivated her, and after parting ways with Grimy, Lucy and Harold decided to embark on a romantic relationship. Eager to shield their love from unnecessary complications, Harold endeavored to avoid any potential troubles. In the early 2000s, he journeyed to England to meet Lucy's parents, Roger and Andrea, who, despite initial surprise at the age difference, supported their daughter's choice wholeheartedly, refraining from interference in their relationship. Expressing his devotion through lavish gifts, including expensive jewelry, Harold spared no expense in fulfilling Lucy's desires. His love for her grew so intense that thoughts of marriage lingered constantly in his mind yet he insisted on perfection before taking the plunge. Seeking to fortify their bond, Harold extended an invitation to Lucy, her son Jameson, and her ex-husband Grimy for an unforgettable trip to Mexico. To Harold, Mexico wasn't merely a vacation spot. It represented paradise, amplified by the proximity of Pete's apartment, lending an air of comfort to their excursion. Inspired by the purchase of a diamond engagement ring, Harold excitedly shared the news with Pete, who harbored suspicions about Lucy's fidelity due to her frequent rendezvous with Grimy. Blinded by love, Harold proposed to Lucy, and she accepted his proposal, leading to their marriage in the midst of 2003. Acquiring a million-dollar home in Warshire County, their new family life in the neighborhood overflowed with joy. Welcoming Jameson into the family with open arms, Harold treated him as his own, fostering a strong familial bond. Soon after their wedding, their daughter Hearth was born, becoming the apple of their eyes. Surrounded by supportive neighbors like Rachel Clark and Stephen Kennedy, Lucy and Harold's familial ties deepened with each passing day. However, as time went on, issues began to arise in their relationship. Harold grew increasingly demanding, expecting Lucy's unwavering obedience. Lucy, who had always been an independent woman, was not prepared to acquiesce to Harold's every demand. Arguments and disagreements became more frequent, casting a shadow over their family life. Their son Jameson bore witness to this tense atmosphere, which negatively impacted his childhood. Even their neighbors began to take note of Lucy and Harold's escalating reliance on alcohol, exacerbating their familial problems. However, when the arguments and shouting ceased, Neighbors interpreted it as a sign that the family was attempting to reconcile. In 2009, Lucy found solace in virtual conversations with her old school friend Garrett via social media. Sensing his wife's emotional distance, Harold made the difficult decision to leave for Mexico, allowing Lucy space. In his absence, Lucy invited Garrett to visit, blindsiding Harold. Upon his return, Lucy swiftly filed for divorce prompting Harold to begin an affair with their neighbor, Rachel Walbin. The divorce proceedings were marred by disputes over property division, 
Lucy, adamant about keeping the house for the sake of their children, opposed Harold's insistence on selling it. Their disagreements intensified as Lucy revealed unsettling truths about Harold's past, further fueling the acrimony. Amidst the emotional turmoil, Lucy accepted Garrett's invitation to spend time with him in Wales, making no effort to conceal her phone conversations from Harold. Upon her return, despite her efforts to salvage their relationship, the constant arguments persisted, and the tension between them became unbearable for Jameson and their daughter, Hearth. On the evening of February 1st, 2010, as the day drew to a close, Harold, intoxicated from several glasses of wine, was taken aback by the delivery of a package addressed to their neighbor, Stephen Kennedy. It was closer to 9 p.m. when Harold returned from work. Stephen noticed a notification that his parcel had been delivered to Harold. Seeing Harold at home, he approached him to retrieve his package. Harold greeted him warmly and offered him a drink. Stephen, not refusing a glass of wine, agreed, and Harold poured him one. As Stephen entered and greeted Lucy, he observed Harold was already inebriated. After a single glass of wine, Stephen took his parcel and left. Shortly after, a heated argument erupted between the couple regarding furniture for their new house. Jameson, hearing the commotion, rushed into the kitchen to witness Harold striking his mother with a kitchen utensil. Reacting promptly, he dialed the police and comforted his sister. Lucy, who was then fleeing the house with the children, sought refuge at Stephen's house, hoping for assistance. However, en route, Harold caught up with her and viciously attacked her with a knife, stabbing her in the chest. Callously, he dragged her body under a bush and disappeared. Hearing Lucy's screams, Stephen rushed outside and discovered her body, initially thinking she had fainted. He quickly realized the severity of the situation. Officer Steve C. Fox, arriving at the scene, promptly called for an ambulance and commenced a search for Harold. Despite efforts, Harold evaded capture, leaving behind terrified children who sought shelter until the police arrived. This tragic incident marked the onset of their family's downfall and the start of a grueling journey towards justice. An ambulance promptly arrived and transported Lucy to Yorkshire Hospital, but it was too late. Lucy succumbed to her injuries upon arrival. Meanwhile, consumed by fear and remorse, Harold sought solace at the doorstep of his friend Rachel. With a trembling voice, he confessed to committing a heinous act, but withheld the details. In an attempt to atone, he transferred a substantial sum of $40,000 to Rachel, relinquished all his assets, including cash, car keys, and paychecks. After Harold headed home, the police began their search for him. They scoured the streets, interviewed witnesses, but Harold seemed to vanish into thin air. Finally, fortune smiled upon the detectives when Harold was arrested on his way from Rachel's house. His face, distorted by fear and remorse, spoke volumes. Lucy's family, Roger and Andrea, were overwhelmed with grief. In an official press release, they expressed immense sorrow for the loss of their daughter and declined to comment further. The forensic medical examination confirmed Lucy died from multiple stab wounds to the chest. Evidence found at the crime scene and the testimony of Jameson, Lucy's son, who witnessed the tragedy, became pivotal in solving the case. The tale of Harold and Lucy is a love story turned nightmare. Although the trial concluded, the echo of the tragedy will resonate for years to come. Harold Landry, found guilty of Lucy's death, was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 16 years before parole eligibility. He would be 82 years old upon release, but no sentence could bring Lucy back. Roger and Andrea found solace in the fair verdict, though their hearts remained heavy with grief. Harold Landry maintained his innocence, vowing to appeal the verdict claiming he wouldn't change anything even knowing the future. The Landry family remained resilient, promising to preserve Lucy's memory by embodying her best qualities for their grandchildren. Despite the irreparable loss, Lucy would forever remain a symbol of light and love in their hearts. Looking ahead, the Landry family embraced hope. Harold received the punishment he deserved while Lucy's legacy continued to inspire her loved ones. With Lucy's love and light in their hearts, the Landry family found the strength to move forward, 
carrying her memory with them into the future. Many Lagerquists on the night of Sunday, July 1st, 1990, Nancy Lagerquist, an 87-year-old resident at Ride Healthcare Center, was last seen alive at around 3.30 a.m. A care worker witnessed the elderly woman sound asleep in her bed. She was not distressed and appeared peaceful. The care worker closed her bedroom door and moved on to the next room. Nancy had been a resident at Riverside since December of 1988. Born in Hamilton, Montana in 1902, she graduated high school at the age of 18 and spent much of her life working as an executive secretary. Nancy was an active member of the Missoula Business and Professional Women's Club. Prior to her retirement, she never married, had no children, and had little in the way of relatives. At the time of her death, those family members, a sister, two nieces, and three nephews, didn't live near the care home. By all accounts, Nancy lived an ordinary life. In the care home, she was unable to walk and required around-the-clock assistance. There was nothing about her background to suggest there was a target on her back. At 4.30 a.m., one hour after Nancy was checked on at Riverside on July 1st, a worker checked on her room once more. This time, however, the alarm was raised. The 87-year-old was gone. The five employees on shift scattered across the building in an attempt to locate the elderly woman, but there was no sign of her. Eleven minutes later, at 4.41 a.m., the police were alerted to Nancy's disappearance. Law enforcement promptly arrived on the scene, accompanied by search and rescue teams. They carried out an extensive search of the home and the surrounding area. The residence was located along the Clark Fork River, and boats manned by police officers were dispatched along the water. At 6.30 a.m., the search was called off. Authorities had found Nancy dead near the riverbank, about 30 minutes downstream from Riverside. She had been murdered in a manner that was described by police as ritualistic. The circumstances of her death were violent, stemming from sexual assault with an object. Her body was then dumped into the water. As investigators worked on the case, it soon became apparent that they would have their work cut out for them. The fact that Nancy's body had been put in the water had washed away any traces of forensic evidence, and her diaper had never been located. The police have never put forward a theory about the weapon used in the murder, and it too has never been found. Detectives soon theorized that the culprit had entered and exited through Nancy's bedroom window, which faced the river, as the screen had been cut. However, the perpetrator had managed not to leave behind any evidence on the window or sill, or in the rest of the bedroom. Furthermore, none of the alarms had gone off at any of the home's entrances, and all were in working order. It's unclear if the home was dusted for prints, but given the number of staff, residents, and guests coming and going from the home, it would have been a very arduous task if it had. The only lead in the case was a man seen by a member of staff at around 4 a.m. walking through the parking lot of the neighboring Missoula Athletic Club, away from the river and towards East Broadway Street. He is described as being white, between the ages of 30 and 40, and weighing around 180 to 200 pounds. He had light brown collar-length hair, a mustache, and brown-rimmed glasses, and was wearing an untucked white and brown striped t-shirt, tan button front shorts, and white tennis shoes with white socks. His t-shirt was longer at the back than the front. This man was never considered a suspect, but was wanted for questioning. However, it's unclear if he ever made contact with the police, or was even identified by them. Reportedly, the description led to the police becoming inundated with reports. Due to Nancy's minimal family ties, a family connection was quickly ruled out, after which the authorities turned their attention to staff members. Staff at the care home would be familiar with its layout and its security measures, and would know who was best to target. Investigators felt that the murder could well be an inside job, and honed in on one male staff member in particular. He was eventually cleared of being involved, but left the care home less than a month later. It is unclear why he left. After ruling out the staff member, the police began to look at the possibility that the crime was the work of an outsider. They noted that security focused on the doors to the home, not the windows, and speculated that Nancy was picked, 
because she was in a room facing onto the river and was not targeted for any reason more specific than that. They interviewed a man named James Bailey on multiple occasions, but eventually dropped him as a suspect. Eventually, detectives looked back at the witness statements they had collected regarding any other potentially suspicious deaths in the home. One nurse had drawn their attention to the demise of an 86-year-old woman named Bertha Scott, an Alzheimer's sufferer who was discovered dead in her bed on May 2, 1990. She was put into restraints at night to stop her from wandering off, and because she had suffered from heart disease, her death was assumed to be from natural causes. Neither the staff nor her family felt her demise was suspicious, except for the one nurse who had noted a bruise on Bertha's neck. She was buried without autopsy. Around the time of Bertha's death, the care home staff had also noticed some tampering with the windows of the physical therapy room, although nothing ever really came of this. On the back of the nurse's comments, the police decided to exhume Bertha's body and double-check her cause of death. Her family was shocked when the police announced that she had actually been raped before being strangled to death. Bertha's life was rather different from Nancy's. She had been born in Pennsylvania in 1904 and was married 20 years later. She had moved to Missoula just two years before her death so that she could be closer to one of her surviving children. Four of her six children had died before her, though she was succeeded by a vast number of grandchildren. During Bertha's medical examination, it was discovered that semen had been left behind. Although a sample was collected, it was too degraded to produce a DNA profile, which would help the police find her killer. From here, both cases grew cold. In 1992, a man from another care home was arrested for sexually assaulting one of the residents. However, he was in prison at the time of the murders. The police also suspected Lloyd Chase Allen of being involved that same year but he too was behind bars when the crimes were committed. In 2002, the Missoulian reported that several of the care home residents had spoken of a man who roamed the halls at night, but staff had never been sure if he was real or not because the residents' memories and testimony were often unreliable. It's possible this man was real and that there are more cases like Bertha's where residents were killed but deemed to have died from natural causes. However, without DNA evidence, a confession, or further investigation, it seems likely we will never see this case solved. Quesera Stops Pretty Places, born on August 14, 2001, and her large family were members of various Native American reservations in Montana, including the Crow and Northern Cheyenne Nations. An extremely athletic individual, Quesera was fond of basketball, football, running cross-country, and wrestling. In her teen years, she had performed in several plays at Hardin High School and participated in the school's choir. She had a big heart and was described as compassionate and loving by all those who knew her. She could often be found tending to stray animals in her spare time. But Quisera's biggest ambition was to become a performer. She wanted to act and sing, and the future looked bright for the determined teen until her life was horrifically ripped away. Shortly after her 18th birthday, Quisera was last seen on August 24, 2019 in Hardin, a rural town less than half a mile off the Crow Reservation, where she lived with her legal guardian and grandmother, Yolanda Frazier. It's unclear where the teen was aiming to go, but one thing is certain, she never returned home. She had planned the following day to meet with her mother to visit North Dakota but she failed to turn up for this get-together. Her family quickly noticed that their texts were going unanswered, their phone calls simply rang and rang, and that Quesera was not active on social media, which was perhaps the most telling clue of all that something was wrong. Later that day, Quesera's aunt, Pelia Balale, went to report her niece missing to the Bighorn County Sheriff's Office, but was told there was a mandatory waiting period before the report could be filed. This was later proven to be a lie. In Montana, anyone under the age of 21 is considered a minor, and an Amber Alert should have been issued. Instead, it wasn't until August 27th that Quisera's family was able to file the missing persons report. The police reportedly told Pelia that the teen was probably out with her friends. There is no record of this, but following her disappearance, law enforcement attempted 
to search for the teenager, they also didn't hand out flyers, which may have helped trace her final movements and prompt witnesses to step forward. Pelia felt that because of Kayser's troubled past and history of running away, law enforcement didn't take her case seriously. Although much of the 18-year-old's past remains a mystery to the public, it has been noted in recent articles that she had some issues with alcohol. In April of 2019, she was found unresponsive at school because she was heavily intoxicated and had to be rushed to the ER. Then, on August 29th, a passing jogger discovered Kayser's body by a wood pile in the back garden of a home at the intersection of Mitchell Avenue and Rangview Drive in the Hardin suburb, where she was last seen alive five days earlier. The homeowner was out of town when her body was found and had no connection to the teenager. Kayser's family was not notified immediately that a body had been found. Reports of a teenager's remains being discovered began circulating on social media and the family caught wind of the rumors. They began to fear the worst. Pelia went to the scene to identify the body, but was turned away without being able to view the remains, and the local media were not alerted to the fact that a body had been found. Kayser's mother, along with Yolanda, then went to the local mortuary to view the body on September 1st, but they were informed that the body didn't belong to the missing teen, so the family continued the search. It wasn't until 10 days later that it was revealed that the body was, in fact, Kayser's. The coroner ruled that she had perished on August 26th and that her death was suspicious. Her remains were already badly decomposed, so the cause of death could not be determined. Foul play could not be ruled out. Following this discovery, the teenager's family kept the pressure on law enforcement to investigate the death. On September 12th, Kayser's mother, Garen, was told by Terry Bullis, the county coroner and the owner of Bullis Mortuary, that her daughter's remains had to be cremated in order to be returned to the family, despite the fact that this was against the family's cultural beliefs and would remove the possibility of further examinations of the body. Furthermore, the family had wanted the D Funeral Home in Billings, Montana, to handle funeral arrangements, but Bullis made them use his business and ordered Kayser's cremation before other family members arrived in Hardin. On September 14th, the family located the scene where Kayser's body was discovered with the help of relatives who lived nearby. They had attempted to visit the area a few days earlier, but were unable to because the scene was no longer sealed off and there was no demarcation of where the body was found. At the scene, they performed a ritual ceremony and noted that the area was very visible and had high traffic. A neighbor, Jason Cummings, who had found the body, told the family that the police had removed Kayser's phone from her pocket and that he had told them to charge it so her family could be contacted. Although they appeared to ignore this suggestion, he too had questioned why the crime scene hadn't been sealed off to prevent contamination. Five days later, on September 19th, the family alerted the media to the case. The Billings Gazette told them that they called the sheriff's office daily for any crime updates and hadn't been made aware of the case. That same day, Yolanda, along with Kayser's father, Alan, went to meet up with Captain Mike Fuss of the Bighorn County Sheriff's Office. When they asked why Fuss had not made contact with the family or returned their calls, he told them he had been preoccupied with other cases. When they asked why the crime scene had not been sealed off, he explained that if investigators arrived on the scene before uniformed officers, then they did not need to seal off the scene. According to Fuss, the scene was only sealed off if officers arrived first. Then Yolanda and Alan asked why law enforcement had not charged and turned on Kayser's phone. Fuss was reportedly surprised that the family knew about this and said that the battery was dead and so they didn't attempt to use it. Kayser's family countered this by noting that they could have charged the phone and looked at her recent communications, but Fuss said they couldn't get into that phone and that not even the FBI could. Furthermore, Fuss implied that Kayser had died from alcohol poisoning where she was found and seemed angry when the family told him they were offering a $5,000 reward for any information. He also revealed that the original investigator on the case, Jeremy Middlestead, had stepped down because he couldn't handle it. Notably, 
Kayser's family was not interviewed by law enforcement until this time. They also spoke with the Bighorn County attorney, Jay Harris, who told the family that the coroner, Terry Bullis, had a conflict of interest in his position as a funeral home business owner and the county medical examiner. Harris also noted that Bullis tended to quickly determine the cause of death as exposure to alcohol and natural causes under his charge as coroner. However, Harris was otherwise reportedly brusque and rude towards the family and failed to provide them with clear answers to any of their questions, at one point telling them, how do you know that nothing is being done? On the 23rd, the family was notified that no missing persons report had been filed for Kaser and that her name was not in the missing persons database. A week later, the FBI declined to take the case on, stating they needed more evidence that Kaser was murdered on the reservation. Interestingly, just days before Kaser vanished, she had filmed a video of several police officers beating her 15-year-old wheelchair-bound brother and uploaded it to social media. The incident involved several deputies from the Bighorn County Sheriff's Office, leading to several officers being reprimanded. It is believed one of the officers who responded to the scene where Kaser's body was found was one of those involved in the beating. This has sparked much speculation that the police were involved in her death or opted not to investigate in retaliation for Kaser attempting to hold them responsible for their actions. In August of 2021, two years after the teenager's death, a fresh report revealed that four witnesses had been discovered. Bertha's life was rather different from Nancy's. She had been born in Pennsylvania in 1904 and was married 20 years later. She had moved to Missoula just two years before her death so that she could be closer to one of her surviving children. Four of her six children had died before her, though she was succeeded by a vast number of grandchildren. During Bertha's medical examination, it was discovered that semen had been left behind. Although a sample was collected, it was too degraded to produce a DNA profile which would help the police find her killer. From here, both cases grew cold. In 1992, a man from another care home was arrested for sexually assaulting one of the residents. However, he was in prison at the time of the murders. The police also suspected Lloyd Chase Allen of being involved that same year, but he too was behind bars when the crimes were committed. In 2002, the Missoulian reported that several of the care home residents had spoken of a man who roamed the halls at night, but staff had never been sure if he was real or not because the residents' memories and testimony were often unreliable. It's possible this man was real and that there are more cases like Bertha's where residents were killed but deemed to have died from natural causes. However, without DNA evidence, a confession or further investigation, it seems likely we will never see this case solved. Quesera Stops Pretty Places, born on August 14, 2001, and her large family were members of various Native American reservations in Montana, including the Crow and Northern Cheyenne Nations. An extremely athletic individual, Quesera was fond of basketball, football, running cross country, and wrestling. In her teen years, she had performed in several plays at Hardin High School and participated in the school's choir. She had a big heart and was described as compassionate and loving by all those who knew her. She could often be found tending to stray animals in her spare time. But Quisera's biggest ambition was to become a performer. She wanted to act and sing, and the future looked bright for the determined teen until her life was horrifically ripped away. Shortly after her 18th birthday, Quisera was last seen on August 24, 2019 in Hardin, a rural town less than half a mile off the Crow Reservation, where she lived with her legal guardian and grandmother, Yolanda Frazier. It's unclear where the teen was aiming to go, but one thing is certain, she never returned home. She had planned the following day to meet with her mother to visit North Dakota, but she failed to turn up for this get-together. Her family quickly noticed that their texts were going unanswered, their phone calls simply rang and rang, and that Quesera was not active on social media, which was perhaps the most telling clue of all that something was wrong. Later that day, Quesera's aunt, Pilia Balale, went to report her niece missing to the Bighorn County Sheriff's Office. 
but was told there was a mandatory waiting period before the report could be filed. This was later proven to be a lie. In Montana, anyone under the age of 21 is considered a minor, and an Amber Alert should have been issued. Instead, it wasn't until August 27th that Quisera's family was able to file the missing person's report. The police reportedly told Pilia that the teen was probably out with her friends. There is no record of this, but following her disappearance, law enforcement attempted to search for the teenager. They also didn't hand out flyers, which may have helped trace her final movements and prompt witnesses to step forward. Pilia felt that because of Kayser's troubled past and history of running away, law enforcement didn't take her case seriously. Although much of the 18-year-old's past remains a mystery to the public, it has been noted in recent articles that she had some issues with alcohol. In April of 2019, she was found unresponsive at school because she was heavily intoxicated and had to be rushed to the ER. Then, on August 29th, a passing jogger discovered Kayser's body by a woodpile in the back garden of a home at the intersection of Mitchell Avenue and Rangview Drive in the Hardin suburb where she was last seen alive five days earlier. The homeowner was out of town when her body was found and had no connection to the teenager. Kayser's family was not notified immediately that a body had been found. Reports of a teenager's remains being discovered began circulating on social media and the family caught wind of the rumors. They began to fear the worst. Pelia went to the scene to identify the body but was turned away without being able to view the remains and the local media were not alerted to the fact that a body had been found. Kayser's mother, along with Yolanda, then went to the local mortuary to view the body on September 1st, but they were informed that the body didn't belong to the missing teen, so the family continued the search, nor tried to tolerate it at first, thinking Zahir might improve. However, Zahir's behavior kept getting worse, and Noor started having serious doubts about their relationship. Despite this, Noor tried to continue their relationship. One day, Noor's sister Sarah came to Pakistan. Sarah had just come back from the U.S. after her studies and was meeting her family after a long time. Noor took this opportunity to introduce Sarah to Zahir. Sarah was also impressed with Zahir, and the two got along well. However, Noor was increasingly disturbed by Zahir's behavior. Noor decided to take a break from the relationship and talked to Zahir about it. Noor told Zahir she was unsure about their future together and needed some time apart. This decision upset Zahir, and he didn't take it well. Zahir tried to convince Noor to change her mind, but Noor had made up her mind. Zahir's anger only worsened after the breakup. Despite Noor's best efforts to keep things civil, Zahir's behavior became more and more aggressive. Noor's family was aware of the situation, and was worried about Noor's safety. Despite their concerns, Noor tried to live her life normally. Unfortunately, Zahir's anger continued to escalate, and he eventually resorted to violence. On July 20, 2021, Noor was found dead in her house. The circumstances of her death shocked everyone. It was discovered that Zahir had brutally murdered Noor in a fit of rage. He had planned and carried out the murder, which was a heinous act of violence. The case of Noor Mukaddam's murder shocked the entire nation and made headlines around the world. The brutality of the crime and the fact that it was committed by someone Noor had once loved deeply made it all the more devastating. Zahir Jaffer was arrested and charged with Noor's murder. The trial brought to light the horrifying details of the crime and the extent of Zahir's violent behavior. It was revealed that Zahir had not only killed Noor, but had also inflicted severe torture upon her before her death. The case highlighted the issue of domestic violence and the need for better protection for victims. The murder of Noor Mukadam was a tragic reminder of the potential dangers that can lurk within seemingly normal relationships. It also underscored the importance of recognizing warning signs and taking action to protect oneself from harm. The case remains a stark example of the devastating consequences of unchecked anger and violence.